G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys AFL Fantasy Podcast. Today we are going to be reviewing a horrible round that was round five and uh, talk about all the carnage that hit our teams over the weekend and what the hell are we going to be doing going into this round. Let's go! Welcome to the Ball Boys AFL Fantasy Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey. You can find me on Twitter at Ball Boys Fantasy. And I am joined, as always, by the coach of the Mighty Oxlongs, Luke Rogerson. How are you, mate? Good, mate. I'm good. We're on uh, on for an absolute marathon. Marathon pod. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just fixing something up here. That's right. I'm for a marathon. We just jumped on the pod pod yes. with, uh, with the guys back over there. Back to back That was good fun. I found it a little bit strange. You know, we're, we're actually listening to what people say because typically... <laughs> <laughs> Typically, I don't give a fuck what you're talking about. <laughs> no. I just want to know about what I'm saying. So <laughs> yeah. it was good to actually listen to some reputable coaches and not just listen yeah, to your shit. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and I had to pick and choose where I put my my two cents in. Whereas I just talk over the hell of you and just <laughs> like you know just dominate the podcast. But uh, we both said it, it sucks a little bit, but because we we work the pod pod into our weekly routine as well. I'm, I'm a listener. Yeah. When I'm driving to to touch footy on uh, Thursday, I. What do I am I going to listen to it back? Absolutely, yes, you will. I yes, am. You <laughs> listen to all my good gear, mate. You don't mind listening to yourself. Uh, <laughs> but let's let's talk this this round. Let's first of all, okay. Wh- what the fuck was that, Luke? What was that round of footy? That was the most chaotic, up and down roller coaster round that I've had in a long time. From the premiums that did dog shit, the the, the high scoring one fifty plus scores that right. we got. The best 18 aspect of it all, like, that was a crazy round. Thursday night, didn't we just think we were top shit? The Coming ch- in here on our live show. Oh, oh, we got ch- the VC locked Correct. in. Correct. The chests were puffed oh. out. We we slept pretty on Thursday night, and it, uh, it only took 24 hours for me to be absolutely throwing the toys out of the cot on Friday night. Yep, and me another... 24 hours after that, same thing. Correct. So. To the point where at the at the end of the weekend, we got the tap on the shoulder from our better halves and said, maybe a little bit less uh, <laughs> footy watching next weekend. Yeah. Which, uh, we, I mean, we probably got to take on board, but, don't we? But we're here. We survived. And, and it, after it all, through the highs and the lows, we've come out with a pretty decent score and pretty yeah. decent rank. So it's throw me your rank and your score on the weekend. How did you, how did you pull up after it all? came out in the wash. That's it. When it came out in the wash, this is why we probably shouldn't overreact uh, game to game. But in the end, we got a 1987. We both scored the exact same. Uh, we did. Uh, this weekend. Even with some, some different players there. So overall rank is just inside 2K now, 1983, um, which I'm pretty happy with. Moved up another 2,000 spots. There you go. Yeah, and you got the big one-point victory over Rids from the uh, the coaches panel, which... That uh, was a nail-biter. It's come down to the last two minutes of the, the West Coast Richmond game. And, yep. um Harley Reid got you the... Got you over the line, I think. Yeah, I don't know who got me <laughs> over the line. <laughs> it's so hard to, to keep track the, of those like, a, like I said to the Pop Pod guys, like one plus one is about my limitations with math. When you've got scores dropping off, scores coming in, don't yeah, fuck, it's hard, fuck hard me. to keep a track of. No, I either. obviously also scored the eighteen, sorry, the 1987, and I've moved up into the top 1,000, which I'm pretty happy to be. Nice, man. 821 is my ranking, and I've also calculated that I'm 126 points away from a hat, so from 100th. Uh, ranked spot, which doesn't feel like that much. I mean, this best best eighteen rounds has kept the, yeah. the I guess, the community quite tight. Um, so that obviously is going to in uh, be interesting to see how things go when we're back to best twenty two after the following week. And I beat Bales. He uh, yeah gave him the beating that he's been giving these other teams. So I won't say that I'm the master beater now, but uh, I, I did get the victory. <laughs> Still Holmes, his joke. <laughs> Wait, that was my joke from a week ago. Oh, he was it? Me. Sorry, I don't listen to you. Uh, um, yeah, no. Let's go into our first segment of the day, and I have a it. lot to get off my chest with this one here. Uh, we are talking, of course, the bogs and flogs. And the winner of the Norm Smith medal. You're an embarrassment to what you do, mate. You're an embarrassment. <laughs> Not too much uh, flogger in this one, but we do have to give a big shout-out. Best on ground, Melbourne versus Brisbane on the Thursday night. Who was it? It's Big Maxi. You big can't Max. go past him. And thank the Lord that Maxi did do what he Absolutely. did. Because otherwise, 
um, my weekend would have been a very different story. Come I, I was even considering at one point, I asked <coughs> you for, for some help as well. Like, yeah. should, do I roll into, because I was really keen on the, the Whitfield matchup, but yeah. I felt like he was more of a VC. And I was like, do I just skip out on Max and go the VC on Whitfield and thank God. I mean, Whitfield went all right, but the extra 29 points definitely helped me by throwing the VC on him. Um the flogs, I'm just going to give it to the Melbourne mids because they, they were all bad, every single one of them. Um, so not much confidence in a few of those guys, especially Clayton Oliver, who is going to be very cheap. But back-to-back, like, sub-60 scores, yeah. you're going to want to see something before he turns around. So flogs for those guys for really just getting smashed by Brisbane. Uh, I think they were already on their bye, essentially. So flog effort. Let's talk about the Bulldogs versus Essendon. Well, I've got a, a slightly different best on ground here. I've given it to Riley Sanders because... At some point, somebody had to stand up to Bevo. Oh. And I, I think the... Throw the water bell, bottle, mate. It's an act of defiance. Yeah. I like it. Put I, the heat on him. Look, I know Mick Malthouse is old school and he came out and said you can't do that. And to an extent, I agree with him. He's never had a fantasy team. <laughs> <laughs> He's never had a fantasy team and his player gotten subbed out. I can tell you right now. But Bevo is just like the man of contradictions at the moment. You oh. can go back and look at preseason stuff where he was talking about Riley Sanders, AFL ready, what a gun, get him in. And then, you know, in post-match, oh, well, Riley understands that this is part of his development, getting subbed off. Like, this kid's got energy to burn. He don't yeah, need to get subbed off. You're full of shit, um, So, <laughs> best on ground for an obscure reason, <laughs> Riley Sanders. <laughs> yeah, for, uh, for, for the demonstrative sort of don't sell me again action. I wonder what that conversation's like, closed doors, isn't it? It's, oh, I don't, It's got to be. It's, I'd love to be a fly on the wall on everything, any meeting that Bevo ever has. And for that reason, he, well, not that, but many reasons, Bevo is my flog. Bontempelli is the flog. 53 points. Not fucking good enough. Um, look, I'm not a Bont owner. I was feeling kind of good after Friday, or yeah, Friday night. Karma came back and hit me like a truck. But for anyone who traded him in or started with him as uh, you, you traded him in last week, just a sickening watch. Yeah. Uh, and Bevo just for getting cute, man. Like they got, Smashed. They look shit. It, it was. They weren't the bulldogs. They were the dog shit. That's what they were on Friday night. <laughs> wow. Um, so I don't Not know that. if that doesn't. You know, alarm bells ringing for those uh, in, in. You know, for Bevo's future, I don't know what will. So we'll see how it all pans out over the next few weeks. Giants versus St Kilda on the Friday. Uh, so the Saturday, the Saturday game, uh, best on ground. Who have we got here? Yeah, there are a few high scorers, and this guy wasn't the top scorer, but this guy just got to keep giving him his props. Jack Steele has been. Potentially the, the pick of fantasy, you know, a lot of people are on him and um, he's just doing what we were hoping he did. So vanilla one there, but Jackie Steele, you're the bog. Absolutely. And it was a, not, a, not an easy matchup for him there. He's still got it done. A flog here for, I mean, selflessly, I don't have him, um, but selflessly for those people who do, Tom Green, another example of a premium midfielder just sucking. Um, so sub 80 score uh, last week was a, was a below par score as well. So back to back disappointing weeks for Tom Green and... Uh, I've heard that the traders gave him a bit of a roasting on their podcast saying that he's a fantasy ambassador. I've got to pull his socks up. So. Get him back. I hope he gets back on the pod because <laughs> Cal- Calvin's going to tear him to shreds. It, it's, I know that each year is different and there'll, there'll no doubt be countless examples in the past as well. But it, there hasn't been this year a fully priced midfielder that to this point in the entirety of the five rounds buys considered yeah. has been... An absolute well, smash I think Sarong's there. probably the main one, and he, he he's was, had two low ones. He was average. Well. Merits is probably the one, of course. Um, of course. Merit and Sarong, but even then, like it's it's not by much. It goes. No it, one's I over one twenty anymore. Uh, outside of Steel. Yeah, and it's interesting because it, it it goes to show, like, yes, every year they'll probably one of those fully priced guys that does continue to do that, but pick him. Yeah, like, that's the challenge. It's so yeah. it's uh, interesting learnings for next year too. Uh, Carlton versus Adelaide. Best on ground. Walshy. He's come back, Walsh. come back in and given his he bang. Does this. One I have heard this and he also does this thing where he then goes and gets injured. Yeah. So um, yeah, maybe this, this one's different, but uh, he could be a trade target for a few people this week. Flog, Jordan Dawson. What the fuck was that, mate? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you are one of the best. And first of all, Jordan, if if this was, I want to know whose idea this was. Barreling down the camera, mate. Keep keep going. Uh, who whose idea was, was this? A Jordan captain put my hand up. I'll do the selfless thing and go forward. Or was this a Matthew Nix thing? I want to know whose decision this was. And <laughs> going to write a strongly it, worded email. It, it, it just it <laughs> infuriates me because he was clearly clearly the best player for Adelaide last year. Um, I know he hasn't gone on to a good start this year, but the talent is obviously there. I don't think. He's been disappointed, but he hasn't been the issue. 
I don't think, and people will point and say, it works, they got a win. <laughs> Bullshit, that was why oh. they got the win. They got the win by the skin of their teeth. They were super, super accurate. They still got smashed in the clearances and the um, contested ball work. Like, their midfield got beaten. They won because of accuracy and inaccuracy from Carlton. So, I'm worried about Jordan Dawson. I'm worried about what's going on with this Adelaide Crows. I think this is a bit of false sense of security after a, a victory over Carlton. But, um... Yeah, it's just not good. Not good scenes over at Adelaide. Lots to play out. So, uh, Matthew Nix, you, you just get the flog award for putting your best player in the in the forward pocket. Interesting discussion. Interesting discussion. Anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> you got that off your chest. Yeah. So, Gold Coast on and Hawthorne. Um, bit of an insipid performance there from the Hawks this weekend. So, my bog goes to the Gold Coast rookies and those boys that are coming Stepping through for us. Stepping up so in a time of need. Closey and Graham, that's the thing. You almost... It, the fantasy community is never happy because if we don't have enough rookies, we complain. And I think there's a case to to be made this week where you go, oh, now we've got we've our got, choice of we've rookies. we too many. And, yeah. and we, we, we just want them drip, drip fed yeah, to us, Yeah, I think. give us one at a time. But, uh, Will Graham, Closey, you guys can have the best on ground. Rookies scoring like premiums. Premium scoring like rookies. What a backwards <laughs> world. Uh, the flog here. Carl Amon, where the f- two weeks in a row, mate? Yeah. Two tons in a row. Where the fuck was this when we needed it? Um, a lot of us traded him out now. Um, if you held on to him, uh, I think it's, you know, evidence says it's a good hold. I'd continue to hold now, but um, yeah, just a little bit earlier, mate. Where, where was this before? So he's the flog for that reason. Port Adelaide versus Frio. You've got an interesting one hitting, <laughs> written here for the best. <laughs> I, see, I, see, I said this on the pod pod too, but. Just Butters' extended arms there on, on his approach to the football. In no way, shape, or form were those arms intending to pick if, the football up. If Butters, if if that was if that was Willem Drew, do you think he's getting suspended? Uh, I think he would be getting suspended. Oh, I actually I, think he would. Too. I have this. I have that inclination. And obviously, Twitter was ablaze um, with obviously non Butters owners calling for the suspension. But I was quietly sitting there yeah. thinking, no, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this. So, um, thank you for extending those hands in the most obscure, unfootball related way you could, Zach. Because it <laughs> the seems fact, to the have... fact that it's Butters and he's like an ever so slight chance for a brown low, and this would have ruled him out of contention. <laughs> I think that's what saved him. To be fair, because, I don't disagree uh, with you, but from a fantasy perspective. Happy days. Well, I'm thankful as shit because I've also got Matt Crouch and if I had both of those guys suspended, I would have not shown up tonight. Um, let's talk about the flog on this one. I'm giving it to Jordan Clark. A bit harsh uh, because he didn't put it up as 97. He went 66 this round. I knew it was going to be a tough week, obviously with a tough matchup, but 66, man. Um, and it's not even like there was no marks to go around. Luke uh, Ryan, the, the seagull himself, racked up a bunch of marks and scored really well He's in that game. Sponge. So it's not seagull, mate. Sea sponge. Uh, yes, that too. Um, he, he yeah. there's no excuses, mate. One of your one of your defenders went off. You could have too. So he he's not escaping the flog for this game. Speaking about a bloke who went off, Geelong versus North Melbourne. She's goat, best on ground, mate. I thought that I was at Madam Two Swords to to. to Watching this game because there was that <laughs> there much was wax. So much wax. There was. Did I pronounce that correctly? To swords, to swords. I don't know. Just say it with confidence. I would have believed you. I don't know. Madam to swords. The wax on the she's. He yep. was drip dripping in wax. He was getting angry at people when they didn't kick it to him when he wanted to get a hundred point loss. Kick it to me. Legit. We're on here. The he, comeback's on. He was as sea spongy as I've ever seen it. Um, <laughs> and if you don't have him, and I know there's a few people out there, some smart people out there that that faded him. You're basically watching every North Melbourne game, just crying into your pillow afterwards uh, because he can score. He is, I believe, is he the highest outside of Sam Walsh who's got one game? I believe he is the highest averaging player so Uh, far this season, averaging 129 points. Just massive. And uh, I'm going to find another way to not put in my top five captains this week coming up against the Finn tag, but uh, he'll probably get it done again. Just reliable. I'm going to give the Flog Award to Chris Scott and the sub rule because... um, What's, what's the Geelong Jai rookie? Clark. Yeah, Jai Clark. Just This would have been a perfect game just to roll out the young players, get some... some you know, they even have a laid out. I thought it he was, was happen. He was the sub. They got the laid out with um, uh, Hawkins. Hawkins coming out with management as if they didn't know that that was going to happen leading into the game, first yeah. of all. And uh, yeah, didn't put the young kid in there and also waited till the last quarter when it was clearly over. But yeah, the sub rule just sucks because there's a cash cow who's just absolutely... Stopped in uh, their cash generation. So that one sucks. West Coast versus Richmond. Let's get through this one quickly, Luke. Yeah, well, I mean, I can't believe you haven't put the flog as Richmond, but another guy that just needs his props is Elliot Yo. Um, and this is, with other with other things going wrong in our team, this is a guy that um, touch wood in, you know, historically has been one of those things going wrong. But this season, 
doing wonders for us. So absolutely, keep it up, yes. Oh well, I I could have given it to Richmond. Look, we've got an abomination of a of a team out there, but we've got a shit ton of injuries as well. So we a do. bit harsh to some of the young kids, but I'm going to give it to the guy that I've been pumping up all preseason, <laughs> and that is Jeremy McGovern. You make me look like an idiot, mate. I've been pumping up for for months, and you've gone and dropped to 49. <laughs> Uh, finally, they had a game where it wasn't living in their back half, so <laughs> he couldn't get involved. So I wouldn't count on that every week. <laughs> no, I don't think that's going to... Oh, can't play the Tigers <laughs> every <laughs> week. But let's move on uh, away from the bogs and flogs and talk about some general strategy chat. It is... You're going to play it again? Ooh, why do you never play this? Oh, that's, oh, that's <laughs> the wrong one. <laughs> Shit. And the winner... I just like the sound of on the outro. You're an embarrassment to what you do, mate. You're an embarrassment. Bever, you're a fucking embarrassment. Uh, let's move on. And harsh talk. words. Very harsh. Uh, let's talk about the strategy for this week. We're going into our final best 18 yep. before we've got five consecutive uh, rounds of best 22. What are we thinking about? I mean, we've had three best 18 rounds so far. What have we learned? What have we learned so far? I don't know if I've learned much because it seems different every week. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, it's easy to ride the the roller coaster of emotions that y- your team's going through. But I actually think we have learned a few things. I think that there is more um, of an opportunity for some of that kind of double downgrading type play. Just during, work on your cash jam during those buys. I th- I think that's definitely been something that I'll take out of it so far. Um, is that you you may not get hurt and you may even improve your ranking. Well, despite, yeah. You- um, you know, prioritizing cash gen. So if, that's you, if you if you traded in Blake Drury instead of Marcus Bonds and Pelly this week, you would have been fifty points better off. Bro, bro, I was so close to doing that too. I had it in my team. Mate, oh. You have a million dollars sitting in your bank right now. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> like I'm you can't looking. write this shit. Oh, this is sickening stuff, bro. And I fucking did Drury duty last year as well. <laughs> oh, and, Drury duty. And fucking hated every second of. It. Um, um, but I, I just think there's there's like opportunities for you to uh, prioritise that cash gen and not get hurt by it as well. Um, yeah. The, the thing I struggle with, though, is we can say that all in hindsight, but, like, it could very easily be the reverse this week. Like, you, you could you could do a double downgrade and they suck it. Like, all the rookies suck and you, you're stuck with, like, a 30 on your score. But like, everyone has all the rookies. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But you maybe missed one of those ceiling scores and that, like, final score is the one that counts on for you. Like, yeah. it, it, it's so hard. So... The hindsight says that that's the way to go, and it might very well be, but uh, I don't know. I still feel like if you make those upgrades, you're going to get there. Um, but it, it is sort of... I, I do agree that so far, it's the, the, the making the cash has been the right play. Something um, I'm really excited about for this round in particular is it, in the previous rounds, I've often thought, okay, I think I kind of know what most coaches will do. I think I kind of know. Like last week, we yep. thought it was going to be like a house closey and then someone to yeah, Flanders, Flanders, something around yeah, that yeah, round. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'm genuinely this week looking at it and thinking, I know there's people that will do a double ground, downgrade. I know there's people who will speculate on a downgrade and then like a guy like Caldwell, mm-hmm. mid-pricer. And I know that there's people with some cash in the bank that will be able to get a full upgrade. Yeah, so well, sh- I'm yeah. actually really keen to see how this particular round shakes up in terms of the rankings. So I actually think yep. there's a lot of different ways you could go. I do think that is definitely the case. It's it's, it's sort of like a, a fork in the road from here on out where I think we're going to start to get more and more unique um, until it is sort of that luxury trade sort of stuff at the back end of the season. So, Blake Drury. Yeah. <laughs> Blake oh Drury, man. Oh, my God. Like, yeah. Yeah. Sh- uh, sorry I pointed that one out to you because that, that, that stings even just it, saying it. Like, it was to the point where, it, like, I thought about this afterwards. If somebody said to me, like, if, if Bont goes under 60, you have to shave your head yeah. or like get a tattoo on your ass You'd or still something. still take it on. I'd almost, I'd almost be like, yeah, I'll, I'll get a tattoo on my we, ass. We like, looked it up. What was his worst score since it's like five like years. 2017? COVID so. excluded. Yeah, yeah. And even in COVID, he barely... Yeah, yeah. like once or twice. That's that's the kind of level that's we're talking shit. about. Yeah, um, that's so bad. So apologies to everyone. I, I broke him. But. Yeah, <laughs> you really did. Um, let's talk about some other things that we, we've alluded to the cash generation and, and the rookies are putting their hands up. So we've got yeah. multiple rookies coming to this round. A lot of us would have gone the, the same closely last week, but his teammate, Will Graham, put up a ton. Um, Blake Drury, like we mentioned, he put up a ton, uh, had 11 marks. They've both got negative 20s break-evens. We've got... Biggie, who's um, coming in with a, a negative 10-plus break-even. Yeah. We've got all these rookies putting their hands up. Plus, we've also got some rookies getting dropped, getting injured, subbed. Is is this the round where we go, 
the the double downgrade makes the most sense and does it make the most sense for everyone or is it team dependent to to borrow a catchphrase from the coaches panel i think it's always team dependent yeah i i, I have to say they've got it right there don't they I, yeah. I think you're always looking at your your team looks very different to my team but we've copped some similar bullets we'll probably end up doing something different so i think that in my mind the rookie of choice this week is will graham and i believe so too it's interesting because and you often talk about this as well if if going to a cheaper rookie gets you the upgrade that you want to do then maybe that's okay Sorry, you, you when you do talk about trading out players, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think there's every chance with someone like a Blake Drury as well. Go back and look at his scores last year. Like a hundred is the most ridiculous anomaly that you'll ever see with eleven marks. Like yeah. I, I would be absolutely shocked if he can even go fifty from here based on what we've seen, unless something something's changed. Whereas a guy like Will Graham, I I feel as though. Oh, well, he's got a great role. He's like, got an he's, awesome he's in role. There. His job security looks great. It's like there's no one like sitting in the wings, you know, looking for his his job coming up. Once they move Flanders out of there, there was CBAs to be had, and you know, like Swallow's not coming and taking that role off That's him or anything like that. So you're paying a little bit more, but I think you're getting something a little bit more certain. The other thing too is like he did that on what was it, 14 tackles or something like yeah. that, and um, moist they, run they coming got up. Moist runs, they moist tackles. cuddles. Yeah, there's going to be some cuddles. We don't mind a moist so cuddle. I, I agree. I, I think Will Graham. Um, it, you, you want both the Suns boys. I think the Suns boys in yeah. Closey and Graham. You, you want to have those guys in. They're very high priorities. If I didn't have both of them, it's a certain double downgrade. I, I, I tend thing. to agree as well. Um, so those boys, I think, like highest priorities to make sure after this round you've got both of those Gold Coast Suns rookies yeah. because they look like guys that are going to make us a lot of money, probably get us all the way through to the buys, essentially. Um, and they can probably score decent enough on our ground as well. Um, Close is probably going to get that midfield status after this next week. And um, when some of those other guys like Sharp, Roberts, uh, Sanders, McKercher are ready to go out, they can f- slot in back into that midfield and um, you know be those on-field rookies that we... Um, replace them with. The question more is around the the Drury's, the Biggies. Um, uh, Hugo Garcia scored really well in really limited time. He had 53 points and 34% time on ground. Um, like these guys here, which we're a little bit less sold on their job security and their scoring ability. I'll, I'll talk about Blake Drury because I think he's an interesting one when it comes to Yes, he scored shit in his first year. He had two games where he played not as a sub or... <laughs> you zoom in on his picture. Yeah, the Red Rocket, mate. He's The Red Rocket? Yeah. You can't say that, mate. No, I can't say that. Uh, but he, he had <laughs> one game... we his head. He had one game where he scored 53 um, against the Saints. Yeah. He had one game the week after where he scored 25 against Port Adelaide. Let's also remember, Port Adelaide, he scored a 25. It's terrible. They got smashed by 80 points. Now, they will continue to get smashed a lot. But... He's 20 years old. What's to say he hasn't got just better? Well, I, what, 80 he, points better? Maybe not 80 points, but if he goes if he goes 60s, he's already got a negative nearly break even of 30. He goes 60, he's making 200K from here. Yeah, the negative break even is is probably a clincher if you're looking that way. Isn't it like it, you know, projected here? If he only goes a 50 odd, he's still making you almost 60K, which is um, nothing to be sneezed at at all. So, um like, are we taking this opportunity to maybe say we go a McKercher to uh, a Graham and then also doing like a fix up of a red dot rookie? Maybe yeah. you can do something like a, a Zach Reed or um, uh, a Jai Clark or something over. Like, it's a bit of that sideways move yeah. with the fact that you could hide behind the best 18, get that cash generation going, bank a lot of cash so you can start that upgrade cadence the following weeks with a lot of premiums coming down in price. Like, you talk about those flogs that we went through. There was a lot of big names that did not score very well. So that the pool of players coming off good scores and we're confident to jump in is is not huge, I would think. Yeah, it, it's... Look, it's an interesting one too because, uh, you know, you're not expecting 100 from him. But no. he plays Hawthorne next week as well. And, you know, if you, can score, if you can score 100 Hawth- points... Hawthorne and North won't... Well, you would hope it's not the beatdown that it was. And, and even in a beatdown, like... Well, that's what I mean. If you can score that against Geelong when you're getting absolutely pumped then you know there's potential to score well against Hawthorne as well so do you think he's the preferred option over Biggie and the other thing I want to ask about him is like what do you think a a small forward for me is in some ways like perhaps the most volatile yeah subject to dropping and and investing um 
because you've got a whole host of yeah. players at, at your club that can play that small forward midfield sort of role. What do you see his job security like? Well, just watching the game, and we, we, we did watch this game. I, I actually really liked what I saw. He was getting, he was everywhere. Like, obviously, 11 marks is, is a bit of proof of that. Um, and he was working hard up the ground. Like, he was, he was playing a small forward role, but I think um, he only had two marks inside 50. So, of his 11 marks, nine of them were right up the ground, working hard. So, it's, as a role for rookies, it's not the worst role. Like, it's not like a key forward. Sometimes it's even better than a wing role because that's also got its uh, volatility. Is it better than a key defensive role for North Melbourne? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I don't know. Biggie versus Drury. I, I, I liked what I saw more from Blake Drury. And they've got, you know, um, Toby Pink there for, for Biggie there as well. It's probably less risk to get subbed out or be used as a sub. So that's in his favour. I mean, what do you what do you think? I'm nervous. I can see this being a little bit of a Harvey Thomas type thing. Obviously, it's not like he played West Coast, but like Harvey I Thomas is and he comes in and scores eighty next week. Yeah, well, the the yo yo we should call him. But <laughs> like he's had thirteen kicks, eleven marks. So I'm guessing a lot of those kicks came from the eleven marks. He's not having eleven yep. marks. I I'd be shocked if he has. Well, no, three or not, four marks. Y- yeah. And then suddenly those kick numbers come right down because he's not so kicking. So say it, he's halving. If, 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 he, if you project him to average 55 from here, is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah? I think so. For some teams. If you don't have um, other pressing issues. All I'm saying is he's shown us a stinky, stinky around yeah. his floor. Okay. So are you are you in that case then? Are you going to a, a biggie over a Drury? I might not double downgrade. Yeah. Just, is, so the question marks there lead you to, if you're not sure about double downgrading, just try to get an upgrade somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, stuff will change in the week, I'm sure, as well. There'll be more things that come out in the wash-up and, and different bits and pieces with players that will influence our decisions. But at the moment, I'm, I'm certain on Graham. I'm sketchy on yep. the other two. Fair enough. Let's talk about suspended players. And there's really only one player that's relevant here. But we can use this, I guess, as like a, a talking point if we get more of these suspensions. They were every, every other week last year. So they might start to be back in fashion again to suspend these guys. Uh, Matt Crouch... He's suspended. He's got the week. They're not fighting it. They're accepting it the one week. Yeah. Now, in upgrade season for premiums, I think the strategy recently that has been proven to be successful is you hold a player for one week because if you can make your team better, if we call Matt Crouch a premium, say I have him off my ground. I've got one fewer premiums this week. If I can get an upgrade, I essentially have the same amount of premiums as I would have if I trade him. But next week, as he comes back onto my field and I get another upgrade, I'm walking away the week after with more premiums than I did if I traded him. So that's been sort of the strategy. Now, best 18 muddles these things a little bit as well. But also the Crows midfield mix and the changes they make, I think also muddies these things a little bit more as well. So where do you sit with a Matt Crouch and suspension and and what, what should we do with players who miss... One week. Yeah, well, the question, the question is, do you, you mentioned the word premium, do you consider him to be in that premium role? So I, I know you've got some stats that you'll yeah. talk about in a second, but like the two trains of thinking are, okay, I expect Matt Crouch to continue to do his 100 to 105 stuff. I really like that. I'm going to keep him in. But you've got some stats that suggest that maybe he might not be continuing that kind of 105 form in the future. Yeah, so I traded him after two rounds. Um, the first three rounds, he was averaging basically 74% time on ground, um, went 73, 74, 74 in terms of time on ground. He's also gone 68%, 82%, and 71% in terms of CBAs. The last two weeks, since they put Saligo more in there, they put uh, Rankin more in there, uh, he's gone down to 55% CBAs. So if you combine 55% CBAs with the reduction in time on ground, he's gone down to 67% time on ground. Now, it doesn't seem like much, but those two things together dramatically reduce my confidence in him being the player that I traded into um, at the start of the year. So I was thinking in that previous role, he was going to be someone to average a low 100 type of score. Whereas now I think if that's going to be his norm, he's probably more that low 90s kind of a guy, um, which makes him overpriced and not really what you would consider a premium. There's um, also an argument to say that he's done what he needed to for your team now yeah. and you're just being forced to make that upgrade a little bit earlier. Yeah, so could you, you, you could, could you happily view do that, that as an upgrade of the week? 
do you walk away from this week saying oh, I've upgraded Crouch the to trouble is who Sam too. Walsh or something? Like, does that feel like an upgrade? It kind of feels a bit sideways, but at the same time, if he goes back to scoring nineties and Walsh goes one tens, like there's twenty points every week. It's an upgrade, isn't it? So there's there's probably it's an upgrade, but just with a few red flags surrounding it. I think. The, yeah. I think the issue is that you've been forced into it earlier than you were want, going to want to. So my, my goal with him was to run him up to his round his fifteen buy, buy yeah. and then then trade him out then. But yeah, so it feels a bit a bit icky, and also the fact that you have rookies that are the cash gen's just gone through the floor now, McCurcher and the like. So yeah, tricky one with Crouch. I, I think given the data that you've got there. Maybe it is a trade. Yeah, like if 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 this was Zach Butters, I'd be saying hold because mm. I have way more confidence in him being a premium that I'm just happy to hold in there. And if he got the week that we maybe thought he should have, but um, then I'd be saying hold. If Matt Crouch, I think, is a different story. Is is sort of the bottom line there. So I think at the moment, I'd, I'm leaning towards trading. I think Bond should get a week for that stinky performance. Yeah, he, well, he might as well last week. He, he effectively <laughs> did. He's a sped play. Worse, his price went down. Got, yeah, true. <laughs> Better if he doesn't play. Uh, and then the last point I want to talk about here for general strategy chat is just patience versus stubbornness. Alluding to players like Bont and Pelly, Tom Green, yeah. Dawson. When is it right to be patient and just say it was a bad week? We've got to hold these guys. When is it... When is that more stubbornness in like I'm digging my heels in, and when should we know when to know when to hold them, know when to fold them? You know, oh. as the saying goes. Like, what's what's the line there? Well, if any, I mean, if anyone knows the answer to this question, they'd bloody be a ten time car winner, wouldn't they? But I think, um, and you guys will hear this when the pod pod comes out this week as well. But Holmesy makes a great point on there, um, where he talks about particularly with these guys that are that you've paid top dollar for, Bont, Sarong, Tom Green. Uh, on any given week, these guys, we know they can give us a 150. And the, the trouble, as much as there is proactive coaching and getting off a guy that has had a role change or something like that, mm-hmm. if you're dropping you know, a Bontempelli whose role really hasn't changed, if you're dropping a Tom Green Sarong whose roles really haven't changed and suddenly you get off and everyone else gets on for the cheaper price and then they, they give you that 150, they skyrocket, you may as well say goodbye to your season. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I think there's an argument to be made for when people get make those aggressive moves and get off a premium where the role's gone to shit. Yep. Maybe it is like a Jordan Dawson this week or something like that. But yep. um, if there hasn't been anything to change in the role, there's every chance you could be left with egg on your face. That's that's always what I lean back on. Like, Bonson Pelly, he had a shit game. But he yeah. played the inside midfield that he's been playing for the last three years. Um, and, you know, like, nothing's changed there. He's still Bonson. I thought I was dreaming, that. hey? It honestly felt that way. Um uh, Tom Green, same thing. He, he's had a crap game. Like these things are unfortunate, but they they're parts of like the variance of of a normal season. Yeah. Dawson, I feel is a bit of a different story. Like, and I want to contrast or compare Dawson to someone like a Callum Mills last year. So Callum Mills last year was going into the season. He was coming off the back of back to back one elevens, but at the start of the season, he he started the season poorly, but he did it in a different role. And the right move in that situation was to trade him out because he really stunk it up over the last few uh, rounds, even leading to the fact that he got injured. But before then, it was a failed pick. Um, so if Dawson, who is still you still got a bit of price on his head. Uh, what is he sitting at right now? Sitting at 900... Oh, no, sorry, 939,000. He's still priced at 108. If he is now a 50% midfielder, 50% forward player, what what can he average? If he, if he is averaging 95, you, your over's by 13 points. Mm. So if you can get him to someone who's going to average 110, you're effectively... It's a 15-point upgrade, but the price is much easier to attain, yep. even though it feels like a sideways move, if that makes sense. I guess it just feels like, it, it's just a question of, do you think that that role is going to stick? If the role sticks, what's the downside? And what else is hitting your team? Like, what what other things could you do with your trades? And it's a very difficult situation to be in because obviously Matt Crouch is now suspended. So maybe he has yeah. one week where he goes all right. Um, but hard to know whether that'll yeah, last. It's hard to know. If, if I was in your position, I'd just be looking and listening to everything that comes out of Adelaide this week, trying to get yeah. your hands on all the all the uh, press conferences and everything and just trying to get a hint on what's going on there because um, I don't envy your position. Yeah, and also he's going to... Like, look who he's w- w- going up against. He's going up against the same team that held Bond to 53. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what's, what's going to happen there? I don't know, but it's... um. 
It's a very difficult position. I think if you have a luxurious position, I do think trading off Jordan Dawson is a play. Um, I think I would try to prioritize getting off someone like a McKercher. Make sure you do get Will Graham. Yeah. Um, but I don't think trading out Dawson, who I am a little bit worried about his role change and the, the team around him also changing, is not necessarily the same as jumping at the shadows of uh, of Tom Green or a Bont just having bad games. So... That's where I sit with those. Patience versus stubbornness. Now, speaking of absolute impatience, who (laughs) are we? (laughs) (laughs) Let's chop these players out. Uh, Yes, so these guys are chops, I think, this week. Number one, I believe, is Colby McKercher. It's sad because we wanted to run him up and we had dreams of pushing him into our back line and things like that. But I think that dream is over, Luke. He has the injured score. Don't even know if he's going to get up for this next round. And he was playing poorly before getting injured in the midfield. That's two weeks in a row uh, where he's been in the midfield, not scoring as good. Uh, We've got these other rookies coming through. They can kind of do effectively what he was doing. So he is out of here with a break even of 87. I think he's the number one trade out priority. Colby Mahercha this week. He did Mahert us all. Uh, The Caleb Windsor is at number two. He is someone on his buy. He is going to start to go down in cash soon. He has a 49 break even on the back of a six, uh, sorry, a 34 point scoring game. He is 400k, so I think he is someone that I'm pretty keen to get off of. Massimo D'Ambrosio, he, he's going backwards now. He literally just got his break even and didn't make or lose any money last week, but it's going to start to go down now. That's a big bullet that I dodged. Hey? That is a big bullet, yeah. You got, got, on, the, got on the wang and never looked back, mate. Um, and uh, number four is Jai Clark. Uh, he is someone that it's a bit more of a luxury move. So he has not made anywhere near as much cash. But yeah. again, he's going to start to go backwards, which, look, it's almost worse than a red dot in a way because at least in a, with a red dot, they're not going backwards. You can use them as a loop. Yeah. If he's just going to continue to be a sub, you've got Dangerfield probably coming back now this week. These trades really hurt because you look at that and, and you look at other trades you could make and how much cash you could make. And this sucks. This is the appeal of the double down downgrade yeah or a downgrade and a sideways essentially yeah but it, you're right it could become very stinky very quickly couldn't it yeah it, it, if you don't move him this week i think he is going to be someone that just sits there until the mid-season buy i think this round if you want to get rid of him this is the round to do it because of that best 18 because of the yeah. options we have available to us um that are still at least a little bit cheaper than him but it's tough because it maybe makes your other move a bit harder to do. And at number five, I do have Matt Crouch, which we obviously have already spoken a fair bit about, but I do think that he is someone I'd like to be trading. Uh, Unfortunately, I have three of these top five players and a few people also there. So some tough decisions to make. Let's talk about some other players we haven't spoken about. Blake Howes and Seth Campbell, they can go now if you've got some other things. I've left them there because they scored pretty well. Blake Howes scored well. I think with no... um, Salem there anymore. His scoring will maybe reflect more of those better scoring games than the poor scoring games. Seth Campbell also, until this last week where we did look dog shit and we probably will continue to look that way, he was scoring okay beforehand. And again, he's not going backwards in cash, yeah. which maybe some of these other guys are. And you can use the loop option to your advantage. So that's why I've actually got them behind some of these other dudes. Um that are mo- that might be playing. Yeah, it's something to consider, isn't it? Just um, checking out what loops you have available, especially with those buy players. We talked about Dawson. We talked about Bonds. What about Luke Jackson? Now, Sean Darcy has basically all but confirmed the fact he's going to be playing this week, but they play West Coast. He dropped a stinky 74 this past week. Yeah. Are you giving him the week against West Coast, or are you, are you seeing the writing on the wall, maybe use this opportunity to downgrade but also upgrade and then do another sneaky move. What, what do you think there? Well, I, I think my understanding, if you picked Luke Jackson as a forward, like th- this was potentially the round if you have Gorn. That you're well, if you've got for, Gorn, it helps, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, so yeah. if you're looking for ruck cover, I think that like Good call, it, yep. it's a no-brainer, especially, uh, I mean, even if Darcy's back in, you kind of go, well, having him is better than having nothing. Um, yeah, good call. I do think that it could get very bleak 
uh, for him from here if uh, if the big Darce man does come in and, and take the lion's share there. I mean, it's like you talked about uh, early days and if you went the Luke Jackson pick, it was always going to come to this kind of... This, uh, this period, yeah. This, this bit where you needed to... You were hoping to get that cover, but you were also going to be playing with fire with Darce. So yeah. um, I'll be interested to see what coaches do there, whether it's this week, whether it's next week to um, move off him. Yeah. But I probably wouldn't this week. What, what, in a perfect world with Luke Jackson, what I would be trying to do, whether it's this week or next week, what I would be trying to do is he does still have a bit of money on his head and if he is someone that you're going to want to trade at some point I'd be trying to make it a trade where you can bring him down to someone that's got enough value maybe it is like a Lukosius or something like that Mm -hmm. trade into a Lukosius maybe they score effectively the same thing but you're still making maybe $170,000 in that trade so then you can still get an upgrade somewhere else so it doesn't feel like just a sideways shuffle the issue is that if he's going to start going down in cash and these other guys come, come up in cash each week you hold off on that, the less like valuable that trade becomes. But you raise a good point there. If you do have a max score and you you're playing effectively, you know, twenty one players this week and you're dropping yeah. off only three, uh, I think it's worth holding Luke Jackson, who could easily meet his one oh seven break even against West Coast. Yeah, th- this week is the exception for sure. Because yeah. even if he plays forward, like you said, um, but I, I don't mind the aggressive move from that point. If Afterwards. then if Darcy's still in there, I don't mind the. If coach. he's rucking more than like sixty percent of the time, yeah, I don't mind the I coach think. saying I'm off and I'm not even going to see it and I'm I'm going to get uh, proactive. But I think we're going to start to like you know if you, if he's a player in your team, you've got to start to plan that um, now. Essentially, with that cash kind of the thing in know, his favor doors is, moment in mind. This is true. The thing in his favor is the line that he's on. It, yeah. it's like even if it goes bad he's not yeah probably maybe he goes to one of those Richmond fours or something like that you know and you could still make be. a bit of cash so yeah. something to consider uh, and the last one here is Riley Sanders now he's subbed out his break even shot back up to 50 um I think most of us will have something better to do than trade out Riley Sanders um but oh. could this be an aggressive move I, I think you're right in saying that most of us will I mean like Everyone has Colby McKercher, so yeah. that's that's got to be sorted he before, goes before this. Yeah, I think so too. And um, the the thing I just have to think as well is, you know, no matter how stubborn Bevo is with the amount of criticism that, and th- this is probably um, obviously coming from the fantasy community, um, but it's starting to come, I think, from more of like the mainstream uh, uh, yeah, footy community. So like uh, the volcano erupted, I think, the other day, and and basically said he needed a translator to work out what was going in yeah, the Bevo legit. I agree. Press conference. So. Um, you know, I, I'm um, not a Bulldogs fan, but um, yeah, I think there's going to be some heat coming in and you wouldn't continue to make him the sub. Like, surely he's not that stubborn. Uh, you would hope, you'd hope to God that he doesn't do it at least two weeks in a row. So we can maybe assess after another week, yeah. maybe he gets forward status, maybe he doesn't. Um, but I do think this just is a wake-up call that eventually he's going to go and maybe he's not the guy that's just going to sit there in our forward line if he does get DPP just to the end of the buys because that sub risk will always kind of hang over his head. So um, I think he's probably down the list of priorities, but just another warning sign. We've got to get these rookies out of our team sooner rather than later. Let's talk on the other side of things with some trade targets. We talked up Will Graham before. He's my number one trade target and a pretty fair way up there. I do have Blake Drury at number two, but... We talked about whether or not that's right for your team or not right for your team. I just think the cash generation, I'm pretty confident he's going to make about 200K from here, which is definitely useful. I think the game he had buys himself another three rounds at least. He kicked two goals. It was one of the few shining spots in that team, I reckon. Um, then I've got Sam Walsh at number three, the first and the highest um, rated upgrade target, yeah, you'd say. Okay. What, what are your thoughts on Sam Walsh? I really like it for the potential of what it could be. I think when Sam Walsh is fit and healthy and in the right role, he is like a premium, premium midfielder, like an elite yep. midfielder in the competition. So I definitely like it from that perspective. Uh, it's also a good pod play um, to an extent. You know, I don't know how many people will get on this week, but he still would be less highly owned than some of those other big guys. Um, the injuries are worrisome for me but then there's also that thing in the back of my mind that when Carlton were up and about at the end of last year 
that um, you know his average wasn't all that impressive, but I think you've got a few points that maybe to the contrary. Well, there's there's a few. It's it's hard to get a clear picture because there were so many moving pieces in Carlton's team last year. Like they had so many guys in and back out and in. Like if you look, go on DFSAustralia.com, like and look at their CBAs. Like there is greens and blues and whites everywhere uh, because so many players are just in and out. So. Last year, he averaged 55% CBAs. There were games where he was above 80%. There were games he was below 30%. In the finals, however, which is where he did go off, Mm. he was consistently sort of high 60s, 70% midfielder. And on the weekend, he he, he had sent a 70% of center bounces. That's where I think the difference is for him and his scoring. I think that he can be someone that if he goes and averages 110 from here from a 70-plus percent CBA position... I wouldn't be shocked at all. The other thing I think also bows in his favour is the fact that um, there's no Doherty. Yeah. And if you compare like some of the other mids in that team, like Cripper, George Hewitt, like they're not the guys popping out for that open ball. Chera was it's out probably him and Chera. Who was out on the Chera was out, who I think did a hammy. So I think he is missing. There's one week hammies now, mate. Didn't you hear? Yeah, well, we'll see about that. Um, but I think, I think he might miss at least a couple. Um, Mate, if it's awareness, it could be season over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, he's, he's the guy that's that spread from, you know, the contest kind of midfield. Over he works I think so hard, doesn't he? He works so hard. He does it with tackles. He does it with marks. So, I, I do like it. He's priced at 102. So, where do you think he can get to? Is it enough meat on the bone to just completely launch into it? Or, like, where do you see him averaging this year? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I can see him being a 110 guy. It, like, if the role yeah. is there and he... I don't think that's out of the realms of possibilities. Um, so, he, I, he's averaged 109 to, points before. I think I... Just me personally, I think I I probably want to see one more week of the role. Um, but maybe I'm being a little bit cautious there yeah. Um, as well. But if I saw next week, hey, we're still above 70% CBAs, the body's looking good, then... Potentially, that's... Uh, so, his run coming up, he's got the Giants this week. And then he does have Geelong, Collingwood, Melbourne, Sydney. So, that actually is a better run. The Giants are a tougher matchup. Uh, so but we did see Jack Steele go go pretty big against them as well. So, I don't think it's a horrible matchup. Like, it's not a Port Adelaide type matchup. Mm. But after that, Geelong and Collingwood are some of the easiest midfielders to score against so far this season. Um, so I do think you've got a week to look. Yeah. But I also don't mind the move early. Yeah, if you, I don't think I'd talk anyone out either way. It especially could be one of those moves you look back on and think, oh, we should have gone a week earlier and, um, you know, everyone else got a leg up. So um, We talked about Biggie there as well. Jai Caldwell is someone that we were Ooh. watching closely on the weekend and we he, he did everything that we could have hoped him to do. Well, he played better than Caldwell. He did called great. Um, he... <laughs> That was terrible. Uh, He scored the ton, back-to-back tons in his score um, average now. So, price just over 700K, Mark, 704,000. Forward line, you've got those injuries for Essendon. That is the biggest question mark, I think, though. It's more the role that we were looking at. Yeah, he had the role. So, so the question then is how long uh, are Setterfield and the Perky Boy out, I guess? And does them coming back in push him back out after that? I mean, they played the best game. Of the season so they, far. They did play well. I'd still be shocked if he would then became the guy over um, those guys. But him and um, who was the young fellow that did that? Durham. Um, yeah. yeah, exceptionally well. They played really, really well on the weekend. So if, um, like I said, Setterfield and Perky Boy, if it's like a four or five week thing before they're coming back in, I don't mind that pick of Jai Caldwell, especially like if you can pick up a guy at that price who for the next three to four weeks gives you something in the mid nineties. That's unreal. Yeah. In the forward line, to be honest, if, if you're in a position where maybe you can't get that really good upgrade target that you want this week, this I think could be a good alternative to the double downgrade. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I like, he's probably my preferred target in the forward line of all of those guys. The, what I really liked about it is the fact that he got 10 marks and he's not normally known for that. He's normally known for his, his tackle and, and defensive work. Yeah. Um, and, like, he had eight tackles the week before, four tackles this week. Like, and he only had 23 disposals. Like, it's not like he's gone out and gone an out-of-the-box 30 disposal game. Yep. Um, I think that scoring, like, makeup is somewhat repeatable. 
Um, so I think while those guys are out, like an average in the 90s, I don't think is out of the question, which is sort of at the top of the forward line. The only question mark I do have is if it is a short-term play and if he does sting you a bit later. Um, if he can get you to the buyers, I think that's that's a win. Yeah. If, if those guys come back before then in two or three weeks and he goes back to you know, playing a bit more of that forward role, um, just pinch hitting in the midfield. I think that that could come back to sting you. So there's a little bit of risk involved there. Um, some other guys we'll talk about here. Jack Lacocious, another mid-80 score. Are we enthusiastic enough? Is it just not quite good enough to point us that direction? He's still very cheap. He is. It feels like every week that goes by, it obviously becomes less and less appealing because he's he's going up in cash. Um, so he's still priced at 72 and a half. If he's going to go 85, he's over 10 points unders. It's uh, In a way, I think it's almost tough with him because we kind of haven't seen that one where he's just taken, taken it by the scruff and gone, I'm here. Yeah. So if maybe if we saw like, you know, last week he drops a 110 in that back, okay, okay, like, you know, yeah. this is a guy that has a little bit of bit of pop to him as well. But could this um, be the one that you jump on early, you know, and the pop comes and you're the first one there? It could well be. And and he's shown, I mean, what, in the last three or four weeks, he's been really, really consistent in that, like, mid to high 80s range, hasn't he? So Yeah, he's, he's, had, a, he's had a few ceiling games in the past. Like, if I go back to his 2021 season, which he did average 86 for the season... You know, there's a few games in there. He's got a 117, a 106, a 106 again, 125, yeah. 103, 105. But there are a few floor games in the 60s. There's 150 in there as well. The role he's playing too, It's a there's a little bit of that slippery when He relies on marks. Out. So the big games that he's gone is 14 marks. Um, there's a couple of games, 11 marks, 10 marks, 13. He's needed to get to those ceiling scores. And the um, Darwin games coming up, I think... Like I, I think I said this before, but he's going to be more susceptible to a poor score than someone like a Flanders that's who his, just racks it up regardless. His best average in ground, mate. I showed you that. Yeah, he'll kick five goals. That's what. That's all he does. <laughs> that's all he does on that ground. It's probably one data point. You, uh, you pointed out and you were frothing over this man and was fair I? enough. Bradley Hill. Um, okay. This very is, interesting role. It, it's weird because it, it makes me sound like a dirty chaser because he's what 150 or something well, on the Well, something's weekend. changed, though. Like, well, I kind of feel like it has, and this is I want the help of, of the keen-eyed St Kilda observer to help me with this because I noticed in the Richmond game two weeks ago that it, it just felt like I could see Brad Hill was lining up as a half-forward at CBA, like at, at yep. um, CBAs, but then inexplicably he was basically getting involved in Wax City with... All of it. his disposals were it, effectively on the half-back line. It, the title was Wang v. Boner feet Brad Hill. Yeah. Um, so w- what is this role he's playing? Because he's starting as a forward, but he's effectively doing as he pleases. He's taking disposals out of half-back. He's just... He's getting a heap of marks. and He's doing whatever he wants, essentially. I, w- I want to know, is this something that is going to persist at St Kilda? Is this... Are these just two sort of anomaly games? But... Um, I just want to get people's thoughts on it because I want to know whether what I'm seeing is just something that's completely different to what other people are seeing. Uh, he spoke about it as well. He spoke about having a different role these last couple of weeks, I think, after the game. And um, it's a very interesting one. The thing that maybe just shies me away from launching into it as a fantasy pick is he's 718000 Like, he's priced at, from a points figure, he's priced at 83 points per yeah. game. Like, it's... It's cheap based on what he's done these last two games in that role, but like, what do we actually feel like he's going to go? Like, he'd have to be a ninety guy and essentially be a top six forward. He would to yeah. be a value pick, and I think the risk is not worth. So the reward's not worth the risk, I think, with this one. But I mean, one fifty. Oh, it's big. I mean, after a hundred the week before, it is an interesting one. Like he, he's you know thirty as well. Is there an argument to say that he's over the yeah. hill? <laughs> oh, I just clicked that one. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, you could you could say that. You could say that. 13 marks, 10 marks. 10 marks at bloody Norwood. That's a lot of marks. That's uh, yeah, I mean, they, they were interestingly high too because the Wang had a few marks there yeah. as well as the Bone. But he started on the half forward line. I mean, it's a very interesting one. If What is that role? A ball, it's a ballsy tell me. pick, but it's probably a bit too ballsy for me. But there's a world where I see it work. He also has Port Adelaide coming up in two weeks, and I don't know if a role like that will be... Not as fruitful. So, yeah, not not so good in a matchup like that. Probably versus the dogs, oh, it could go good, but um, probably not one that I'm going for there too much. And then the last one I'll speak about another a forward player, Isaac Rankin. 
as someone who scored well, kicked three goals, however, but definitely more in the midfield. Is he someone that we should be considering? He's in the 600000 price bracket. Um, I'll just bring it up here. His price at 682000 So cheaper than Caldwell, cheaper than Brad Hill. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably ranking him at the bottom of the list, um, just as you have... As, yeah, I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to wait for you to like keep going. Yeah, one day that, I will, that's but it, it's that's it. all about the joke. So, so do you actually think you'd rank him below all these other guys? You'd you'd put him at the bottom because he's probably got because like, you've got the Caldwell factor of like maybe it's a rental sort of situation. It's a rental. Um, <laughs> is keep is it he clean. is he like? Do we expect this to continue on for the rest of the season now, or is the Adelaide midfield still too volatile? Well, that's what I think. That that's what I'm saying is like you you've literally got a team that people are trying to get off or considering getting off. Yeah, guys like Dawson, guys like Crouch. So there, there's obviously so much uncertainty and volatility in that team. Like, let's be real, they they stole the win on the weekend. They did. Um, you know, in terms of scoring shots and probably the way the majority of the game went, it was it was um, Carlton. I mean, props to him. Like, obviously, you, you won the game. You, you do what you need yeah, to do. So but I don't, don't mean but to I don't know. Like, if you if you like play that. that game out another like ten times, I, I yeah. think they lose eight of the games. Like, I, I think so too. It it just all the point I'm trying to make. I think is I think that there's still volatility to come at Adelaide there. Yeah, um, unfortunately. Agreed. So uh, it would be a, a ballsy pick. But he, I mean, even he got what a hundred on the weekend, and that was with three goals. Yeah, true. Um, so. If yes, he he's a goal one kicking goal, midfielder. Like, exactly. Yeah. Suddenly it looks, uh, you know, in the 80s and it's far yeah. less impressive. Yeah, so I, I think I tend to agree, which is why I favour the Lukosius and Jai Caldwells if you're looking for that cheaper forward target. I, I think those are the guys I prefer. Mate, lots for us to consider. Any uh, final thoughts before we wrap this one up? What? Are, where, where are you leaning with your moves? Uh, like, have you got anything cashed up or where are you where are you thinking about going this weekend yeah i haven't had a really good play around with it thus far so but the the reason i'm excited is because i can see me you know i can see myself going in in lots of different ways so maybe i do um get that letter in the mail and go do jury duty again we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll see but um yeah and maybe at this stage call wells in the sights um Right. So, you know, McCurch is probably going to go and that's going to become Graham. And what, One play we didn't touch on um, that maybe we should just quickly spend a bit of time is Nick Dacos. Mm. Obviously coming off his buy round, going into a Port Adelaide matchup. You and I have both sort of said we're waiting until after that Port matchup to jump on him. Yeah. But if you were really keen, would you talk anyone out of going in on Nick Dacos first week after his buy? Yeah, not not if you... Um, like, if you'd planned around it and you'd, you'd budgeted to get in Nick Dacos this week, then I don't think I'd talk anyone out of it. I, I think that potentially the better um, play for, like, an enormous... Uh, pod and ceiling might be like a Walsh instead. Yeah, um, this is where, like, if you... Like, say, say you want both... Yeah. The smart play would be go Walsh this week, Dacos next week. I think that that's probably what you do. Um, now, if I was to say which one am I more confident that I'm like I absolutely want in my t- my side, it would be Dacos. Yeah, but I think this is where you've almost got to try to get a little bit greedy and and try and work those matchups, work the draws, work the break evens, and just try and get that the best side as you possibly can. For the long term, even if maybe Dacos does better this week, like he's going to be, he's not going to get away from his prices. Uh, probably going to at least, at the worst, sort of stay where it is. Whereas uh, Walsh, it's not a, a stupidly bro- low break even, but it, there's every chance that if he, if he comes out and drops another big score, he will obviously tick over that nine hundred thousand mark break even seventy three. If he goes one twenty, he's up around that you know nine nine ten nine twenty thousand. So it does just sort of hurt you in the long run. So, yeah, I think that'll wrap it up. So uh, we'll be back again with our live show. Hopefully, we'll have a new technical difficulty to show with you guys and experience with you all. So make sure you check out that one uh, this week. It will be, again, at that 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. No more daylight savings. And uh, my sleep schedule is letting me know about it. Uh, So in the meantime, guys, do go and check out... um, our podcast make sure you like and subscribe the video if you haven't already give this one a big thumbs up turn on that notification bell if you want a question head over to ask me at q ask me on q.com forward slash ball boys and you can submit your question there uh stay tuned on uh social media i will be doing a bit of a shout out i think this week i'm planning to do uh, a 
bit of an hour of power where I'm going to answer as many questions as I can on cue for free, uh, just so you guys get a sense of what it is and how it all works. So I will confirm that on Twitter. So stay tuned for that one there as well. Uh, but until next time, guys, we'll see you on Friday. Bye.